I'll do a demonstration run through of the tool and just, I guess, uh, show you how you can uh, optimize a design uh, at the um, a planning stage or the schematic stage for meeting these multiple criteria. Uh, now, feedback from uh, the testing that we've done is that once you've uh, used the tool a bit, it, it takes probably about 20 minutes to uh, take a project through the tool. Um, so it's really designed to be quick and as straightforward as we can make it. Um, and also just to have all the defaults in there so that even if you don't really change much other than put your uh, site sizing in, uh, you'll still get a good result. So how we use the tool is that we uh, go to this URL, which is uh, watersensitivesa.insightwater.com. Uh, if you Google it um, or go through the Water Sensitive SA website, you'll be able to find the tool quite easily. Um, once again, just make sure that you are using the South Australian version. All right, so how it works is you need to uh, register for the tool to use it. Registration is free and using the tool is free in South, Austra South Australia. It's sponsored by um, Water Sensitive SA and, and the state government and uh, various government agencies uh, and also the Water Sensitive SA partners. Um, and how it works is you go to my projects and you just create a new project or you can edit one of your old projects. Now for today, we're going to take a case study of uh, just a fairly intense townhouse development. So a fairly standard design. Uh, here we've got a simplified diagram. We have a couple of deep soil zones, a bit of visitor parking out the front and uh, a, uh, a driveway. Um, We've got eight double story townhouses um, on quite a small block. So it's 1180 square meters. Um, and we want to try and get this townhouse development passing all our integrated water management objectives. Um, so how we do that is we start by entering the details um, into the tool. Uh, we select a council. Um, I'll just pick uh, a random one, or you can put not available. Um, but let's let's do Gula, just uh, for no good reason. Um, now, when you select a council, it will automatically bring up um, 20 years of localized uh, rainfall data and also the 2016 IFDs. The uh, intensity, frequency, duration curves um, for your site. And we'll put in the site area, which in this case is 1180 square meters. Uh, we'll tell it what sort of development it is. And uh, we can put in, uh, in an address using Google Maps. Um, and let's just say it's a uh, development off to the side here. You drop this little pin around um, to pick your site. Uh, and um, you can see that some of these sites have already been re redeveloped like these ones. So we'll pick one that hasn't. Um, and uh, you can, I guess, use this function to have a, have a nice look at the existing site. Um, and its conditions. All right, uh, if any councils are interested as well, this um, will geotag this site uh, for uh, later meta-analysis in your GIS system if, if needed. So have a chat to Mel if you're interested in that. Um, now we, we then put in uh, the floor area of the site minus the garages. So um, this site has about a 360 square meter, we'll call it double story um, plus garage. And so let's just put about 750 square meters of, of people in here. All right, sorry, I should be looking at, 
Uh, yeah, so we have a question about maintenance. I'll come back to that, um, some of these systems uh, as well. Um, and Melissa's answered that. So we need to work out basic building occupancy um, because that lets us work out our water balance for our site. Um, the number of people in the building will uh, determine the demand and the drawdown on the tanks. So um, this is a really simple calculator to try and just estimate uh, occupied, occupied average uh, occupancy. So once we've got our site details, we come back to this reminder that we're uh, doing multiple objectives using different techniques uh, for the different systems. And we find that things like rain garden, uh, rainwater tanks will provide outcomes for multiple objectives. Um, however, depending on the specific circumstances, some councils might choose to ignore things like volume or quality uh, depending on local constraints and, and stormwater uh, objectives. But how we use it is we essentially just enter our impervious areas into the tool. So we start with a roof connected to a tank and immediately it'll bring up this uh, simplified diagram of a, um, a water tank system uh, and this might also get reflected in, in the report that's printed. Uh, so we can say all roofs. Uh, there's no reason to put every separate roof. Um, the tool does uh, add, uh, sum up the different pervious areas for the roofs anyway. So um, we can just say all the roofs. And if we have a look here, we've got uh, 360 uh, square meters of roofs connected to water tanks. So 360 and we'll start with about 2,000 litres per dwelling. So let's start with 16,000 litres and we'll uh, leave the detention tanks, the detention for now, uh, but it does support tank based detention or underground detention. Uh, we then add another impervious area. Uh, so in this case, we might have roof not connected to a rainwater tank and if you add up these areas, it comes to 20% of the downpipes we found just couldn't quite easily be connected round to these water tanks. Um, so that's 90 square meters. Uh, and we can add a treatment or not, but we'll leave that for now. Um, but you could say put little um, planter rain gardens underneath those downpipes. All right, so as soon as you've done that, the tool will uh, start running its water balances. Uh, we still need to add the driveways though. So we add another impervious area, driveway from our maps here, we can see that that's 205 square meters. Um, common driveway and we can put a treatment on that. In this case, we're doing pervious paving and you can see as soon as we put in the treatment, it comes up with this uh, simplified engineering diagram, um, depending on which system you're selecting. But in this case, we're gonna try pervious paving as, as one of the lowest maintenance systems and uh, we'll make most of that pervious. Uh, we can then maybe add a little bit more uh, paths connected to drainage. So if some of these paths actually had a, had a drain in that connected to legal point of discharge, you would put them into the tool. So I would say other paths and courtyards, um, pervious area we had 180 meters squared and at the moment there's no treatment or you can leave this blank. Um, we also had some pathways that are just sloping off into garden beds. Uh, you can, and also garden bed areas can be excluded from the tool because they're not connected to any council drainage assets. All right, so uh, that's the main bit of work we need to do is just adding these impervious areas. After that, we scroll to the bottom and it shows you whether you've achieved your multiple objectives. And in this case, we have just by putting some pervious driving driveway in 
and some water tanks um, uh, in this case. Now there are different ways of doing this depending on council uh, specific requirements. So for example, if we didn't want to do pervious paving, um, we would find that we no longer meet our quality objectives or our peak flow objectives. So we might do a different approach and uh, maybe put a small uh, rain garden either on the driveway or an above ground rain garden uh, on the downpipes um, with a total of about five square meters. And we see that that would also pass our quality objective, um, but it doesn't meet our peak flow objectives. So this is, this is our storage site storage requirements using a retention approach. So in that case, we might add a bit of uh, retention, sorry, detention storage to the top of these tanks, maybe uh, 250 liters per, ta per tank, um, for example, uh, which would be about 2000 liters here. That would be making sure that there's dedicated detention space in the top of these little water tanks. Uh, and then we find, once again, we've passed all the multiple criteria. Now into the tool, um, we do have some additional customizations and settings depending on, on uh, local conditions um, because not every project is going to be the same. So I'll quickly take you through those. Um, the main one is the rainwater tank settings. Uh, some projects might opt to only connect to a toilet, uh, in which case you can see that their quality result and volume result is not um, not achieved, um, but you know, for example, someone may opt just to connect to hot water. Unlikely, but uh, we've put that in as flex uh, as a flexible approach. Um, you can also look at irrigation uh, and you know find out that you know irrigating's not necessarily a good uh, use of water tanks. It tends to mean that a lot of the time the water tank is overflowing, and therefore it's not very good for stormwater uh, uh, flood prevention or downstream volume atten attenuation. So we'd, we'd, for small urban tanks, we'd actually probably discourage um, irrigation only. Uh, and that's reflected in all our scores down here. Um, but it, it does let people, I guess, play with their designs and work out the best solution for a, for a site. Uh, for high rise apartments, you might only decide that 50% of the occupants will be um, connected to the tank and that's okay, but once again, it will be reflected in your, uh, your scores. Um, what, we, what we're trying to avoid with this graph mainly um, is seeing uh, this pattern here that I would call um, a vampire tooth kind of effect. Um, if the tank's overflowing all the time, and you can see the percentage overflow, uh, what that means is that it's not doing a particularly good job for flood prevention. It means every time it rains, the water's basically just overflowing into a downpipe. What we want to see from our urban tanks, if it's going to have a good integrated water management outcome is good use of the tank, the tank filling up, draining, filling up, draining. And we really want to get this overflow down below about 25%. Um, so uh, if it's going to also be used for flood control and retention. All right, so that's our rainwater tank settings. Um, we also have water efficiency settings. So for example, you, if you have a green building, you might have more efficient toilets um, and that will be uh, factored into your, your calculations. Uh, weirdly, though there's a perverse outcome, a less efficient toilet will actually give you a, um, a better stormwater score by diverting more water uh, out of the stormwater system into the, into the drainage. Um, but, you know, four star, for example, is a good use, uh, is a good, good balance. Uh, the next box I'll show you here is that we do cater for a recycled water source. There are a couple of recycled water sources uh, in, uh, in Greater Adelaide. And if you tick that, or if you have a grey water or 
wastewater recycling system on, on site, uh, it will factor that, that into the calculations. Um, a more, I guess, interesting approach for some of the councils with existing policies is uh, the options for different uh, flow calculations here. Uh, so, and what I mean by that is we have a few different options. So the default option is a volume retention option, uh, and that is capturing um, the difference between pre-development and post-development volume for a one in five year storm, um, based on John Argue's method from the University of South Australia. We also offer yield minimum. So this is recommended uh, for drainage systems that are already over capacity uh, and drainage systems that are basically stuffed and not coping very well at all with new development. Um, so the yield minimum will capture the, f will aim to capture the full volume of a one in five year storm on the site. Uh, from a statistical point of view. Um, if you want to know more about this, we've got the link to the user manual. And this user manual um, really will go into depth, I guess, about what we mean by these different, uh, different options. So um, take some time and read, read the manual as, as they say, RTFM. Um, so, Getting back to the uh, the projects, um, we we can put in on-site detention as as an option. So, uh, if your policy is on-site detention and you still really want applicants to do on-site detention, you can request this, uh, and generally it'll give give you a bigger volume. We find. Um, but, you know, completely valid if, once again, your drainage system is having issues, you know there are pinch points or you've done, uh, done the drainage models and you know that uh, your, your local pipes can only cope with a certain flow rate. Um, so if you are doing on-site detention, uh, there are various other options. So the civil engineers in the room will probably find this interesting and for everyone else it's a bit esoteric, but you can set the pre-development fraction impervious. So say your um, drainage system is designed for quarter acre blocks, you can put that in there, 0.35. Uh, if you're designed for rural, um, you can put 0.2 in there. Uh, or if it's say industrial and it's already designed for an imperviousness of 80%, uh, you can drop that in there as well. Do bear in mind this has implications for the, the size of the OSD tank that you're specifying in cubic meters. Um, but by default, it's set to 0.4. Um, we also have uh, some other settings. So we have the pre-development design storm. Um, some councils may say a one in five year ARI or 20% AEP pre-development storm. By default, it's set for a one in 10 or 10% AEP. Um, and you can have the post development detention storage requirements. So in some very high risk sites um, where there's no uh, overland flow path, uh, some councils do specify this is a one in a hundred. Um, and this is a time when these volumes will actually get quite high. Um, but by default, it's set for a one in 10 year storage requirement for OSD. Um, now, if, uh, if you wanted to say put a, a lower time of concentration than the default 30 minute time of concentration, you can do this by specifying your own permissible site discharge. Uh, some councils will specify this anyway for uh, planning applicants um, and uh, changing some of the other parameters essentially just give you a different PSD. Um, the bigger the number uh, in liters per second, uh, the smaller the storage, um, uh, so just beware of people trying to game this PSD override. Um, if you're designing for say uh, a very large catchment with a very uh, large time of concentration and, and a very small PSD, you can also put that into the tool and it'll give you a very large storage. Um, so I'll just point this out because there is flexibility, I guess, to um, use this tool in pretty much any policy setting uh, for 
on-site detention or retention. All right. Um, happy to, uh, I do need to move on, but happy to go, I guess, into more depth within house training. Uh, uh, talk to myself or Melissa if you're interested in, into really going into the engineering of this. Um, if uh, you did still um, get to the end of this and find you weren't uh, quite meeting requirements and wanted to use an on-site detention system, you would add that in down the bottom here of the tool and uh, your target flow rate, that's in cubic meters, so, and this is in liters, so we'd say, you know, 7,700 uh, additional site storage. And if someone enters that, it immediately brings up this simplified diagram of an OSD tank so that they know, I guess, what they're getting themselves into if they commit here. And that will allow us to pass all the objectives. All right, so once you're happy with the design, um, you can save the project and go to reporting. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this brings us up to, I guess, some of the self-certification reports that can be issued to council. So um, the, the, the tool can do two types of self-certification reports. One's just a certificate report, which is a very basic um, report. Uh, it's kind of a cut down report, but it does give the builder enough information to actually go and build the design that they've, uh, that's been worked through. Um, so you just select that, select your project, and uh, it'll, it'll create a PDF that which you can then download uh, and use as, I guess, a certificate. And it, it does tell you, I guess, what your impervious areas are and what they're connected to. Um, and it does also provide, you know, the specifications for uh, the rainwater tank um, and uh, what we've done for the well settings, um, uh, basic occupancy and that sort of thing, and provides these simplified diagrams uh, for applicants. Um, to really help, I guess, the project as it moves on to uh, understand what it is that they've actually uh, committed to. So there's that. Uh, for uh, analysis, uh, and particularly if you're an engineer or a council trying to um, interpret these reports, there is the calculation report that uh, provides a bit more detail, and this lets you check the inputs to the tool in a bit more depth. Uh, and therefore, it'll give you a bit more confidence that uh, uh, the defaults or the, the specific council requirements have been ad adhered to. So once again, it'll tell you quickly whether things pass. Um, it'll specify impervious runoff areas, uh, rainwater tank and uh, efficiency. Uh, specifications, but then it, it will provide the detail of the stormwater quality calculations, uh, things like the flow strategy used, uh, what the defaults were that were input into the tool, uh, pre and post development runoff coefficients, that sort of thing, uh, all sorts of great um, civil engineering information, including PSDs and critical storm durations, rainfall intensities, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, it's got this table of um, your OSD, Boyd's equation, uh, inflows and outflows for the different design storms. So um, this is really, I guess, giving you a bit more of an insight into the, the back end of the tool and the, um, uh, the rational method calculations we've done. Um, at the end, it will still provide the, the simplified diagrams for applicants so that they know that you know that they know what they've committed to. And I'm just putting in a question for everyone about whether the um, detailed report should be provided every time, particularly the local government people who are on, online. Um, do they think that the detailed report should be replied, provided every time? Or is there a circumstance when the simplified report would be enough? So, you know, finding, finding, finding means checking um, your answers now verbally or just add to the chat if you like, everyone. 
uh, I can mention as well is that um, there is a little bit of flexibility if you if you find there's something the reports don't do that you'd like them to do. Uh, let let Melissa know and we'll we'll uh, consider it in our next upgrades.